Okay, let's open our Bibles, please, to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, you're familiar with this passage, Nicodemus and Jesus. And this passage is actually going to launch us into a topic that we're going to probably talk about for the next couple of weeks. John chapter 3, verse 1 now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked, surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to, spirit, to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. Now there's several things, in fact we could spend all morning just on this passage, but I want to take this passage to launch us into a subject. First of all, he says, Nicodemus, who was one of the ruling council, and he comes to Jesus at night, and he says, we know you're from God, but he says to him, you know, I want to talk to you. And Jesus says, well, first of all, you have to understand some things. He said, you have to understand that one has to be able to see the kingdom of God and then enter the kingdom of God. Two parts of this. See the kingdom of God and enter the kingdom of God. You must be able to have your eyes spiritually open such that you're able to understand that there is more to this life than what you see in this world. There is a kingdom not of this world, but there is a kingdom of God. This world has a lot of kings. In fact, back in the Old Testament, that the people wanted a king rather than God as their king, and so God gave them kings. So this world has lots of kings, but he says there is a kingdom of God. And in order to see that there is a kingdom of God and then to enter into this kingdom, it's not simply one where you see it and you go, oh, but rather I want you to be able to enter and be part of and experience and live in this kingdom of God. The ticket is you must be born again. The ticket is you must be born of the Spirit in order that you might see and then enter into this kingdom of which your natural eyes will not be able to see or experience. Turn with me to John chapter 18 verse 36. John 18 36. I'm differentiating the world in which you live and my kingdom which is not of this world but coexists at the same time as this world exists. There's a huge difference. Some of us who live in the world know firsthand the difference. There's some who are raised in the kingdom of God and God bless you if you had the privilege and the great blessing to be in the kingdom of God since you were as young as you can remember. Some of us came out of the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of God through the mercy and grace of the Lord. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. 
We're going to talk about today the kingdom of the world. Over the next week or two, we'll talk about the kingdom of God, but today we're going to talk about the kingdom of the world, because the Bible has a lot to say about this kingdom of the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Paul is writing to the believers in Corinth, and he says, where is the wise man, where is the scholar, where is the philosopher of this age, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world. So he's saying there's worldly wisdom and there's godly wisdom. In fact, there's another passage that differentiates godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is you're sorry you got caught. Godly sorrow is your conscience is such that you admit that you were wrong and you we're not pleasing to God. And with that comes repentance. There's a difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. The worldly sorrow says, I'm only sorrow because I got caught. <laughs> he goes on in verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Skip down to verse 26. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. This is a big differentiation between world and kingdom of God. In the world, people love to boast. Look who I am. In the kingdom of God, God gets the glory. If I'm anything, it's because of God. If I'm anything, it's because He's gifted me. I've told this story several times. I was having lunch several years ago with one of the, the most prominent architects in this town who has now gone on to be with the Lord. And he said to me one day, we were having lunch, and he said, I've been given gifts. And I was just amazed at how he phrased that. He didn't say, you know, I'm gifted, which he was. But he says, I have been given gifts. If we have any degree of giftings, it's because God gave them to us. I love the way, and T.L. helped me again, because he always has a wonderful way of, of phrasing this about being made known and... People want to be noticed rather than let God be known. People want to be noticed rather than... Let God be known. Let God be known, or make God be known. People want to be noticed rather than to make God be known. That's the difference. Kingdom of the world, want to be noticed. Kingdom of God, make God known. Big difference. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness in God's sight. The wisdom of the world cannot, does not, will not understand God. The wisdom of the world cannot see the kingdom of God. The wisdom of the world, and there's lots of worldly wisdom, but it just can't grasp God. Unless one's spiritual eyes are open to see who God is. As we sang, I worship you because of who you are. We begin to see who God is when we're born of the Spirit and our eyes are opened and we have been brought out of the darkness, the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3. I love this topic. Having been in that kingdom of the world and thankfully mercifully by God's grace prayers of others and
people witnessing to me the opportunity and privilege to be in the kingdom of God. 2 Corinthians 10.3 For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We don't wage world as the we don't wage war as the world does. Though we live in the world, we're not of the world. We're citizens of heaven just passing through. We demolish let's see, it says, every pretension sets itself up against the knowledge of God. The kingdom of the world, if you've noticed, God is not part of their Discussion, <laughs> the word today is narrative. <laughs> God is not part of the narrative. In fact, you'll see this in a lot of media. There's certain news media that you can tell they are not of God. They are purely of the world. Purely of the world. There is no mention of God. There's no consciousness of God. There's no acknowledgement of God. In fact, it is the antithesis of God. James chapter 2 verse 5. James 2 verse 5. Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. In the eyes of the world, someone may be poor, but in reality they are rich. Because the true riches are not the riches of the world. The true riches are being in the kingdom of God, having a relationship with God, bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, understanding the treasures of what it's like to be in fellowship with God, walking with God, in his will, in his purposes for our lives, those are the true riches. Amen. I've said this before, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You know, there's not one store where you can buy those things. So I'm going to walk in, I'd like, give me $25,000 of patience. <laughs> or how about $35,000 of kindness. You can't buy those things. But they come being in the kingdom of God to the Holy Spirit working inside of us. And these are the benefits that not only we get what we give out. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's no price tag and they're free once one is in the kingdom. Go back to 2 Corinthians 6, 14. We're going left to right to left to right this morning. Most of the time we go left to right out of simplicity, but today we're going left to right to left to right. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. This is an important verse, passage. If one is in the kingdom of God, one must be careful not to be yoked to those in the kingdom of the world. How do we know the difference? Well, think of this. Verse 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. I will live with them, walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out and be separate. How do you know if there's a difference? Belief, unbelief. Righteousness, wickedness, light, darkness, Christ, Belial, or Satan. 
belief and unbelief. There will be, at some point, there will be disputes, disagreement, and lack of commonality if someone is in the kingdom of God to be yoked to someone in the kingdom of the world. We will not marry anyone in this church unless they're both believers. There have been people who have attempted and wanted us to marry them who are unbelievers, one believer, unbeliever, we won't do it. You have to be both believers. That's just not the only definition of being yoked. You can be yoked in business deals in other ways, but it says, do not be yoked with unbelievers. Yoke means, remember, yoke, oxen, <coughs> when one moves, the other moves. And they will move in harmony, but if there's disbelief, there will be disharmony in the movement. First John chapter 2, verse 15. <coughs> Now this is a tough one, especially the, those who love sports, <laughs> and I fall into that category. <laughs> I grew up just living and dying with the St. Louis Cardinals baseball team. <laughs> Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. We need to be careful that we are not absolutely passionate about worldly things. I remember some years ago, I found myself being so passionate about the St. Louis Cardinals baseball team because I grew up in St. Louis. I mean, you're just, it's just part of, it's ingrained in the city of St. Louis. And then this is quite a while ago, the owner, not now, but the owner was the manufacturer, the biggest beer producer in the world. And I said to myself, as a believer in Christ, here I am, passionate about this team that is owned by the biggest beer producer in the world. And I'm a believer in Christ, and yet, look the kind of problems that that produces. And I said, you've got to separate yourself from this attachment. Now, I still love baseball, and I still follow the Cardinals, but there's a distance now, and the team is no longer owned by them anyway. <laughs> but we have to be careful about things in the world that we are just so attached to. There's even a passage that says, do not lift up your soul to things of the world, something like that. That may not go down well with some people, but I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Do not love the things of the world. I didn't write it. I'm just reading it. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. It doesn't get any easier. It does not get any easier. I'm not reading from the feel-good Bible today. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. Paul is really forceful about this worldliness. He even says in this passage, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. Mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Here he defines two things that are part of worldliness. Jealousy and arguing. Quarreling. Now, are there times when we feel anger? Yes. But jealousy is not something that is to be found in the kingdom of God. Jealousy is 
I have, you have what I don't have, and I don't even want you to have what you have. <laughs> but he says, I'm addressing you not as spiritual, but as worldly, because there's still jealousy and quarreling amongst you. Those things have no place in the kingdom of God. There's a passage that says, I've learned how to be content, and I have and have not. Two more verses. Titus 2.11. Titus 2.11. The Bible goes on to talk about worldliness and defining worldliness and say being careful about worldliness. Titus chapter 2 verse 11, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. There it is again. It's like the old, remember Groucho Marx, it was, what was that, you know, the, the secret word? How did they phrase that? The, uh, the duck came down, say the secret word, remember, it came down you know, with $100. Oh, there's that word again. Yeah, the Groucho Marx show. Uh, there was, what was the title of the show? It was, uh, no, it wasn't the $64,000 question. What's my line? <laughs> but anyway, it says, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearance of our Savior. It says, say no to worldly passions. There are things in the world that one can become passionate about, become very easily passionate about, because the world has attractions. And yet, if they pull us away from the kingdom of God, be careful. He says, be careful. Be on the alert, but be careful. And say no to anything that pulls us away from the kingdom of God. We'll close with Romans 14, 17. Romans 14, 17. Here is one of the clearest contrasts of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. One cannot enter or even see the kingdom of God without the Holy Spirit enabling us to do so and experience. And that goes back to John chapter 3 being born again, in which the kingdom of God is available, but it's available only when one is born of the Spirit, born from above, born of the Spirit of God, where the Spirit of God comes inside of us and changes us on the inside so that we can then see and be part of and experience the kingdom of God and see the difference of the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. Someone has said that one of the sharpest contrasts of the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God is in the world, the greater you are, the more servants you have. In the kingdom of God, the greater you are, the more servant we become. What a contrast. I want to close this with 
If anyone here is not in the kingdom of God, that we give you that opportunity today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Jesus said you must be born again. The ticket to being born again is to receive Jesus going to the cross for each of us, taking our sin, washing us clean of our sin, and then the Spirit of God comes to indwell us, and then we become changed on the inside, a new heart, a new person, a new creation. And we then have our spiritual eyes open, we become spiritually alive, and we once were spiritually dead, we become spiritually alive that we can see and enter and experience and be part of and walk and talk with God in the kingdom of God. So let's all close our eyes, bow our heads. If there's someone here who is not yet in the kingdom of God, but you know you need to be and you want to be in the kingdom of God, just say this prayer with me. Jesus, thank you for going to the cross for me. Thank you for taking my sin. Thank you for washing me clean of my sin. I want to be able to see the kingdom of God. And I want to be able to enter the kingdom of God. Come into my life right now. I receive you personally as my Savior and my Lord. I thank you that the Spirit of God comes into me right now. Lives inside of me. Changing me into the person that you designed me to be. Living for you. Walking and talking with you in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching our Sunday message. I'm Pastor Dwight Stevens, the founder of the Paramount Church. We invite you to join us for our Sunday worship services at 10.30 a.m. in the historic landmark Paramount Theater building at 139 North County Road in Palm Beach, where the gospel of Jesus Christ is paramount.